My name is Anna, and if my life were a book, you might say I was just about to turn to one of those pages where everything flips on its head. Two years ago, I snagged a coveted position at Lawrence Enterprises, and that's where I met Michael, a few years my senior, and the sort of man who didn't just climb the corporate ladder. He built his own. Our affair was the office's best kept secret. Michael was cautious, but charming, and I was swept up in it all. But life has a funny way of laughing at your plans, doesn't it? Despite all precautions, I got pregnant. I remember sitting there in my apartment, the pregnancy test in hand, thinking about how a single plus sign was about to add so much to my life. When I told Michael, he ran through a whole gamut of emotions, panic, fear, a brief moment where he seemed genuinely excited. But then reality set in, and his excitement turned cold. We have to get married, he said finally, after what felt like an eternity of silence. It wasn't a proposal, more like a business arrangement, and it certainly wasn't what I had dreamed of. His parents, devout Catholics, insisted on it. They said a baby needed a proper family. So, with reluctance, Michael agreed to an engagement, and just like that, we were planning a wedding. Today, the living room buzzed with our parents discussing wedding plans. My mother, Elaine, was fussing over the guest list, while my father, David, was trying to understand the seating chart. Michael's mother, Susan, had her heart set on lilies for the church. And the lilies have to be white, Susan said with conviction, glancing my way. Symbolic, pure. I shifted uncomfortably, the unspoken implications of white lilies hanging in the air. You okay, dear? Elaine asked, placing a comforting hand on mine. Just a little tired, Mom, I smiled, but my eyes found Michael, who seemed more interested in his phone than the conversation. Michael's father, Peter, grunted, looking over his glasses. Son, you sure about all this? It was a simple question, but Michael's hesitation spoke volumes. Of course, Dad, he said, but his eyes finally met mine, and I saw the storm brewing behind them, a storm I was not yet prepared to weather. Just when I thought the day couldn't get more tense, Michael's facade began to crack. The conversation buzzed around the room, but Michael stood up, his chair scraping back with a sound that seemed too loud for the moment. Everyone, I need to say something, Michael announced, his voice cutting through the chatter like a knife. The room fell silent, all eyes turning to him. I felt my heartbeat in my throat. Michael, what's going on? I asked, trying to keep my voice steady, but it trembled despite my efforts. He looked around the room, his eyes stopping on me last. Then, as if he were pulling something from his pocket with a flourish, he held up his phone for all to see. This, he said, waving the phone like he had just uncovered a grand secret. This is the truth. I squinted at the phone, confused. It was a picture of me sitting at a cafe with my ex-boyfriend, Alex. I remembered that day. Alex had reached out wanting to congratulate me on my pregnancy and upcoming marriage. We had coffee, laughed about old times, and parted as friends. It was innocent. But Michael's words twisted the story into something unrecognizable. Anna has been lying to us all, he declared. She's been cheating on me, and this kid, he paused, pointing at my swollen belly, is not mine. My world stopped. What? Michael, no, you know that's not true. My voice broke, my protest sounding feeble even to my own ears. Michael's mother gasped, her hand flying to her mouth, while my parents looked from me to Michael and back again, trying to piece together the narrative he was spinning. Anna, is this true? My mother's voice was a mixture of confusion and hurt. No, mom, it's not, I said but my words felt like they were getting lost in the sudden storm of accusations. Michael's father stood up, his face hard. You've brought shame to our family, he boomed at me. We welcomed you in, and this is how you repay us? Please, I pleaded, let me explain. It's not what it looks like. But Michael didn't want explanations. He wanted an out, and he had crafted it, leveraging the photo as his ticket to freedom. I won't marry a cheater, Michael stated looking at his parents rather than me. And I won't raise another man's child. My mother came to my side, her arm around my shoulders. Anna wouldn't do this, Michael. You know her better than that. Do I? Michael sneered. It seems I didn't know her at all. His parents nodded in agreement, their faces set like stone. 
My father tried to speak up. Now, let's all take a step back and... But Michael wouldn't have it. The wedding is off, he cut in, his voice cold. In an instant, the future I'd imagined, no matter how hastily cobbled together it had been, crumbled to dust. The weight of the betrayal, the injustice of it all, it was almost too much to bear. And as I stood there, surrounded by the broken pieces of what should have been one of the happiest days of my life, I realized I was alone in this storm. The days after Michael's accusation were a blur. Whispers at work turned into full-blown gossip. I walked through the halls, feeling eyes on me, the weight of their stairs almost as heavy as my belly. My parents were my shelter in the storm. Honey, don't let them get to you, my mom would say, squeezing my hand. We know the truth, and that's all that matters. But it wasn't all that mattered, because Michael was spreading his story like wildfire, and his version was the only one people seemed to believe. One day, I walked into the break room to a sudden hush. I knew they had been talking about me. I grabbed a cup of water, my hands shaking slightly, trying to ignore the burning of my cheeks. Anna, we're so sorry about what happened. Lisa, a colleague, finally broke the silence with a pitying look. Michael, well, we just can't believe it. Yeah, Tom chimed in, leaning against the vending machine. We thought you guys were the real deal. Tough break. I bit my lip, holding back tears. Thanks, was all I managed before I left the room, their eyes following me out. When the day ended, I was the last to leave. The office was quiet, and I let out a breath I didn't realize I'd been holding. That's when my boss, Miss Garrett, found me. Anna, do you have a minute? She asked, her tone neutral. I nodded, too tired to speak. In my office, she said, and turned on her heel. Miss Garrett's office was a stark contrast to the rumors outside. It was quiet, calm. She sat down across from me and looked me straight in the eye. I've known you for two years, she started, and I've known Michael for longer. This doesn't add up. What's going on? I exhaled slowly, the truth bubbling up. I met with Alex, my ex, but it was just as friends. Michael took a picture and used it to call off the wedding, claiming he's not the father. She frowned. Why would he do that? I shook my head. I don't know. He's convinced everyone I'm a liar. Miss Garrett leaned back in her chair. Well, I don't buy it. If you need anything, time off, a change of environment, just let me know. Her words were kind, a small beacon of support, but they couldn't fix what was broken. Thank you, Miss Garrett. I just need some time to figure things out. The next morning, things took a sharp turn. I woke up to contractions. Stress had driven me into early labor. At the hospital, my mom held my hand as I brought my baby into the world, a beautiful, healthy baby boy. You're so strong, Anna, my mom whispered as I cradled my son. I looked down at his tiny face, his little fingers wrapped around mine. We're going to be okay, I told him, but in my heart, I knew the hardest part was yet to come. The hospital room was quiet, save for the occasional beep of a machine or the distant sound of nurses' shoes on the linoleum outside. My little boy was here, two weeks early, his cries filling the room with life. Despite the circumstances, it was impossible not to feel a surge of pure love looking at him. Anna, he's perfect, my dad said, peering over my shoulder to get a better look at his new grandson. His voice was rough with emotion. I smiled wearily. He is, isn't he? Mom was bustling around, straightening things that didn't need straightening, her energy a contrast to the stillness in my limbs. What are you going to name him? I hesitated. The name Michael and I had picked out together now felt tainted. Noah, I said suddenly after my grandfather. Dad's eyes misted over and he nodded. He'd be proud. We were interrupted by a knock at the door. It was Miss Garrett, my boss. She stepped in tentatively, holding a small blue teddy bear. I heard the news. I hope it's all right that I came by, she said, offering a small smile. Of course, Miss Garrett. Thank you, I replied, grateful for her presence. She handed me the teddy bear for Noah, He's going to need someone to watch over him. I chuckled softly, the sound mingling with Noah's soft cooing. I think he's already got plenty of that. Miss Garrett's expression turned serious. 
Anna, there's something else. I don't want to burden you now, but I think you should know. Michael's been acting strange at work, taking personal calls, being secretive. It doesn't sit right with me. I frowned, holding Noah a little tighter. What do you mean? Just keep your eyes open, okay? And remember, you have allies. I nodded, the exhaustion from birth and the emotional toll of the past few days making it hard to process. I will. As she left, my parents sat on either side of me, forming a protective cocoon around Noah and me. We're here for you, Anna, for both of you, Mom said, her hand warm on mine. I looked down at Noah, his tiny chest rising and falling in peaceful sleep. I know, I whispered, and that's everything. But in the back of my mind, Miss Garrett's words echoed, a warning that the storm might not be over just yet. Soon, I returned with my newborn son to my parents' house. My father, a practical and wise man, looking at how much I spend on diapers and other children's needs, noticed that the child also has a father. To my questioning look, he replied that I needed to do a DNA test and confirm Michael's paternity. Armed with my father's advice and a determined spirit, I found myself standing on the doorstep of the house where Michael and his parents lived. I clutched the folder containing the DNA test paperwork like a shield as I rang the bell. Michael's mother opened the door, her greeting far from warm. What are you doing here, Anna? I steadied my voice. I want to talk about the paternity test. Michael appeared behind his mother, his face clouding over with anger. You're still on about that? Yes, I said, unfazed by his tone. It's not just about us, it's about Noah. His father emerged, a stern look on his face. Let her in, let's hear this. Inside, the air was tense, the three of them facing me as I stood my ground. I'm not leaving until you agree to the DNA test, I stated. Michael scoffed, I won't be part of this charade. His father, however, cut him off. If you have nothing to hide, you'll do the test. We raised you better than this. Michael's mother nodded in agreement, surprising me. She's right. This is about the baby now. Their insistence seemed to corner Michael, and after a long, heavy silence, he finally agreed. Fine, but when it shows I'm not the father, I want you out of our lives for good. I simply nodded, knowing full well the truth would come out. You'll get the details from my lawyer. As I turned to leave, his mother's eyes met mine, a complex mix of emotions passing through. I left with a sense of victory, not for myself, but for Noah, who deserved the world and more. The courtroom was awash with a tense silence as everyone waited for the judge to speak. He cleared his throat, his eyes scanning the document in front of him. After reviewing the DNA test results, it is the conclusion of this court that Michael Harris is indeed the father of the child. Michael's parents gasped, his mother's hand flying to her mouth. Whispers snaked through the onlookers as Michael sat, white as a sheet, unable to look at anyone. But your honor, interjected Michael's lawyer, this doesn't address the public allegations made against Mr. Harris concerning the mother's alleged infidelity. The judge looked sternly over his glasses. The court acknowledges the seriousness of the allegations. However, the DNA test. Before he could finish, the doors opened and Miss Garrett, my boss, strode confidently to the front with a security officer by her side a USB stick held up like a winning lottery ticket. Your Honor, if I may, there is further evidence that needs to be considered, she interjected. The judge nodded. You may proceed. The courtroom's attention was glued to the screens as the video began to play. There was Michael, my once loving fiance, in the office, his arm a little too low on the back of a colleague, a woman from a wealthy family known in our company. Miss Garrett spoke firmly. Your Honor, it appears Mr. Harris had another motive for his accusations against Miss Bennett. He sought a relationship with a more financially lucrative partner and used the photographed meeting with her ex to construct a false narrative. The courtroom erupted into chaos, people trying to make sense of what they were witnessing. Michael's lawyer attempted to protest, but the judge raised his hand for silence. Michael's mother turned to him, betrayal written all over her face. Michael, how could you? Her voice cracked. I, it's not like that, Michael stammered, but the video left no room for excuses. 
His father stood up, his voice shaking with fury. You brought shame on us, son. The judge called the room to order. It is clear Mr. Harris's actions were premeditated and callous. Not only has he attempted to evade his parental responsibilities, but he has also defamed Miss Bennett's character. We will reconvene to discuss the ramifications of Mr. Harris's actions. Court is adjourned. As people filed out, whispering and shaking their heads, I stood there, my heart heavy but vindicated, Noah cradled in my arms. This chapter of our lives was closing, and a new one, filled with hope, was beginning. The days following the court's verdict were quieter than I had ever experienced. With the truth laid bare for all to see, the once overwhelming cacophony of gossip and judgment from colleagues and so-called friends had faded to a hush. Then came a day that would set in motion a change I hadn't anticipated, a tentative knock on the door while Noah was napping in his crib. Standing on the threshold were the last two people I expected to see, Michael's parents, Susan and Peter Harris. The lines on their faces seemed deeper, etched with regret. Anna, we know we have no right, Susan began, her voice quivering as she clutched her husband's hand. But we're here to apologize, to you and to Noah. Peter nodded, swallowing hard. We've been misled by our own son and we've hurt you. That's, that's unforgivable. I led them into the living room, the air thick with tension. They took in the scattered toys, the pictures of happier times, the evidence of a life they had tried to reject. Why should I believe you now? I asked, arms folded, my stance guarded as I stood by the mantelpiece. After everything, why come here? They exchanged a glance, and it was Peter who responded. Because we were wrong, and because Noah is innocent, he shouldn't suffer because of his father's actions or ours. I took a deep breath, the sound of Noah's gentle breathing from the baby monitor a reminder of what was at stake. You hurt me, you both did. It's not just about believing you, it's about whether you can be trusted with my, our son. Susan reached into her purse and pulled out a small worn photo of Michael as a child. She offered it to me with a trembling hand. This was Michael on his first birthday. We were so full of hope then, I guess. I guess we still want to feel that with Noah. Peter's voice was low, filled with a father's grief. We don't expect forgiveness, Anna, but we'd like to try to make things right. We'd like to be a part of Noah's life, with whatever boundaries you set. We'll respect your wishes, no matter what. We sat there, the three of us, grappling with the weight of what was being asked and offered. Noah stirred on the monitor, a soft coo breaking the silence. I sighed, the fight draining from me. Okay, but we take this one step at a time, slowly. Noah doesn't need more upheaval. They agreed readily, relief evident in their posture and the way they finally met my gaze. As days turned into weeks, their presence became a cautious constant. They were there for Noah's first words, his first steps, always respectful, always aware of the boundaries I had put in place. And somewhere along the line, the ice thawed, allowing for a fragile new beginning. We were not the family any of us had envisioned, but we were slowly knitting together a tapestry of trust and affection for Noah and perhaps in time for ourselves too. Life has a funny way of coming full circle. After everything that happened, the last thing I expected was a chance at a fresh start. As I stood in the park, watching Noah chase after the autumn leaves swirling on the ground, my phone buzzed. Hey Anna, it's Alex, got a minute? I glanced at Noah, ensuring he was safe, and then answered, hey Alex, sure, what's up? There was a pause, and I could picture Alex's thoughtful frown, the way he always looked when he had something important to say. I've been thinking a lot about us, about you really, and what you've been through. And I guess what I'm trying to say is, I admire you, Anna. You've shown such strength and, I was wondering if you'd like to meet up sometime, just the two of us? I felt a flicker of surprise, warmth spreading through me. Like a date? He laughed softly. Yeah, like a date, but no pressure. I just think we've got a lot more to talk about than the past. Watching Noah giggle as he played, a sense of hope bloomed within me. I think I'd like that, Alex. Let's do it. Great, how about this Saturday? We could grab coffee, he suggested. 
I smiled, feeling a lightness I hadn't felt in ages. Coffee sounds perfect. As I ended the call, I felt Noah tug at my coat. Mommy, look, I caught a leaf. I picked him up and spun him around, his laughter infectious. You sure did, sweetie. Noah's eyes were bright with joy, and in that moment, I knew we were going to be okay. Life had thrown us a curveball, but we'd caught it and thrown it right back. Now, it was time to start anew, not just for Noah or for me, but for the possibility of what lay ahead with Alex. With the park's golden hues around us, I realized that this was more than just a new chapter. It was a whole new book, and I was ready to start writing it.